Hey guys, Mr. Arnold. We're going to talk today about uh, change over time. Um, this would be the sort of classical idea of evolution. And the reason we're going to talk about it in H class is that what we're concerned with is its relation to biodiversity. So in, in simplest terms, the, the word evolution or the term evolution just means it's a change in the genetic composition of a population over time. Okay, so that there was a, a set, you know, that, that there was a certain genotype at one point, and that at some point down the line, there is a different genotype um, overall. And we're talking about percentages and probabilities in a population as a whole, not necessarily in a specific individual. We're talking about a population. Okay, so lots and lots of individuals. Um, we can sort of divide this term up into two easy ways to understand it. Um, one of them is what we call microevolution. Microevolution is basically just saying that um, we've got different breeds or varieties of things. And so that's why I've got all these uh, apples here. There are hundreds and hundreds of different varieties of apples. Now, they're all technically the same species for the most part, um, but they all have different characteristic genotypes within them that make them these different varieties of fruit. Um, and we'll talk about it in the next slide here, but this is an example of uh, people actually causing that change over time, that microevolution. Um, that is in contrast to the idea of macroevolution. A macroevolution, what that basically means is that um, there's a new species that comes about, or maybe even a new uh, a, a new phyla, um, that there's a, a newer category of things that aren't able to interbreed um, that's going to result in new organisms. Okay, instead of just different breeds of organisms. So, you know, it's not doesn't mean like oh, there are different varieties of apples or there are different varieties of dogs. It would mean that a, a dog had turned into something else. Um, so there are three sort of ways in, in which that this can occur. The first, of course, is, is artificial selection. And this is like we know that this definitely happens. Humans have been doing this for thousands of years. We have been domesticating animals and breeding animals for certain traits. So um, we wanted uh, cows that produce more milk or we wanted um, hardier horses that were able to um, you know, run faster or that they were able to, you know, withstand long journeys um, or that maybe they needed less water. We needed plants that required less water. All of those things are artificial or human directed um, breeding or domestication and that causes um, evolutionary changes as well. In general, those are going to be microevolutionary things. Um, and then we've got the sort of the big two of, of most bio, what we would term in bio, biology as what we normally think of as evolution. Um, and that would be natural selection and random process. So the idea behind natural selection, we're going to talk a little bit more about this um, in, in the rest of the video, but the idea behind it is the environment is going to determine what individuals are going to survive and reproduce. Okay, so environmental factors come into play there, and some organisms reproduce and some don't, and then that is going to change um, the overall population after a period of time. Um, random processes, it says here, and this sounds like a term, like you're like, what does that mean, non-adaptive processes? So natural selection is, is favoring adaptations that help uh, survival, and random processes are not necessarily adaptations that are going to help survival. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Essentially, this all boils down to um, that what, what it requires is a lot of time and some randomness for this to occur. So I want to jump in and talk a little bit about the randomness, and then we'll jump back to the natural selection part and talk a little bit more about that. So there, there are really three sort of pathways that randomness can affect um, the, the overall genotype of a population. Because remember, what we're talking about is a population of organisms. Um, the first one is mutation. So let's assume that at one point these, these organisms here were all uh, are blocks. We're going to assume that these are organisms and that they were all red at one point. And then there was a, a mutation in the DNA that actually caused one of the blocks to be white. Well, assuming that that block was able to still reproduce with the original blocks, then what that will mean is over the course of time, the percentage um, of white blocks compared to red blocks is going to change. Okay? And again, you, you know, you think, well, this is a microevolutionary thing, but we're over grand time scales, that might change a little bit. Okay? So mutation, some sort of change in the DNA, some sort of random change in the DNA that's going to cause a, the genotype to change, which then causes a different expression of the phenotype. If you don't know what those terms mean, I've got some bio, uh, videos up for biology that you might want to go back and look at as well that will sort of refresh your memory on those things. Um, the second of the important random processes here is the idea of genetic drift. Um, so assuming that in a population that there's random mating, and again, we're talking about non-artificial selection, okay, so what happens in the wild. Um, assuming that the, the mating is relatively random, uh, 
um, that causes some changes over the course of time. And where it especially affects is if you have really small populations. So if you've got really sort of big normal populations and, and they're mating, the, the percentages will stay relatively similar. Now, you might think that that's not the case, like, say, in the case of humans. Well, and again, some things come into play there. If there are social norms and all those kinds of things, that obviously plays a role. But we're talking about just sort of animals out in the wild. And if there's a big enough population, then overall the population outside of mutation might not change that much over time. But let's say that you've, you've, you've got a much smaller population size. What happens over the course of time is like, so here we've got about 60% red. And then over the course of time, that turns into maybe 80% red. And then eventually what that becomes over a long period of time is 100% red. And that's what we call genetic drift. The, the genes are essentially just sort of drifting to a certain point, largely because of the random mating. Okay, that there's no real plan behind that process, that it, it, it just happens um, due to the percentages and probabilities. So the last thing here is uh, something called the bottleneck effect. Now, I, this one I think makes great sense. So let's assume that we've got a population here. We've got three different phenotypes, three different expressions. Okay, so we've got uh, red blocks, yellow blocks, white blocks. And let's say that something happens and, and a bunch of the population dies off. Um, particularly, let, let's say that what happens in our case is that... Uh, a lot of the population dies off, and then what's left, the proportion is that there are no, none of the white genotype left. Well, if that's the case, then what was originally this population over here now becomes a much smaller population. Even when it starts to get bigger, the effect now is that we don't have any of those original white blocks anymore. So those genotypes are essentially lost, that those genes are no longer in the gene pool. Um, this is also similar to something called the founder effect. So if they're if say like let's say instead of like some of them dying off and these were the only ones that survived, let's say that maybe um, there was birds or something like that and they went to another island, but it happened to be that none of the white birds went along. It was only the red and yellow ones, and so then naturally what's going to happen there is that the over the course of time all you're going to have left are those red and yellow ones. So how does this all tie back into the idea of natural selection? Well, the first thing I want to get you know cleared up is. We tend to think of the idea of natural selection. We, we the the phrase that always goes with it is the survival of the fittest, um, and and that is that's not necessarily wrong. I think that's a pretty good idea. But what we tend to equate that as is the survival of the strongest, um, and it actually has a, pretty much nothing to do with the strongest. Um, what it has to do with is the fittest, um, and what fittest means to us um, is. Not in the sense, and I, I put this up sort of as a joke, the idea in Zombieland that, you know, if you run faster, if you've done your cardio and you can run longer, you're going to outrun the zombies. What does that mean? Well, that means you're more likely to survive. That's what fitness means in a biological sense is that you are more likely to survive and to be able to reproduce and therefore pass your genes on, okay? And so that leads us to the idea of adaptations. Adaptations are things that are going to improve an individual's fitness in a specific environment in particular. Okay, so, you know, for instance, um, you might have an evolutionary adaptation that says, hey, um, if, if, you know, the plants that have needles on them um, require less water, and so therefore they can survive better in areas where there's a lower water, maybe the water level changed due to some sort of climactic change, um, and so therefore the, the plants that had much narrower leaves, needles, um, were much more suited to survive, and so those are the ones then that were fittest for their environment. So they're the ones that reproduced more, and then over the course of time, they're going to be the ones that are most dominant in that area. Okay, so adaptations are things that are going to help to, basically just help them to survive and therefore to reproduce. Um, what, what actually has to happen for natural selection to occur then is that we have to have what we call differential reproduction, and that just means that the individuals that have that trait, okay, that, that adaptation that helps them out, they're going to produce more surviving offspring than the other members are. So to go back to our like uh, needle leaf example, um, if it was a, a you know somewhat dry environment and they needed to have the needles there um, so they didn't lose as much water, that would mean that those are going to have a better chance of surviving in a low water environment than say a broadleaf plant um, that it's going to lose a lot of water to transpiration and therefore it's more likely to die. Some of them might live and some of them might reproduce, but probably at a much lower rate than the ones that have that adaptation. And that's what we call differential reproduction. The ones with the, the positive trait, the helpful trait, are going to reproduce more um, than the ones without it. So just to sort of sum up the, the general idea here behind natural selection and, why, and, and how it's going to matter to us in apes, this is the general 
way everything goes, okay? So the genes mutate somehow, okay? That there's some sort of uh, coding error in the DNA, um, that there's uh, maybe some radiation or something like that that causes some sort of change. Um, and that those individuals are then selected by their fitness, okay? That's the natural selection part. And that the, that's going to create populations that are better adapted to survive and reproduce. Now, there's all, this is way more complicated than any of this. I mean, you might make, you know, you can make a really good case. You're like, well, if it has to happen because genes mutate, I, aren't most mutations uh, harmful? Absolutely true. And, of course, what we're talking for about, too, is for a population as a whole, not just for an individual. Okay? So, like, a mutation in a, in a DNA for one single individual um, is probably a bad thing. But it might be, it could possibly be something beneficial. And then that gives them the ability to survive more, and therefore that's going to then get passed down. Okay? So that's the general gist of the whole thing. Now, back to why this really matters for us in apes, because really we're not in biology class. This is sort of a minor detail. All of that is basically just a lead up to the idea that this is going to sort of be the, the underlying theme behind our idea of biodiversity, because biodiversity relies on two things. And the first of those things is speciation, that they're evolution of new species. So... Uh, when, when a new species comes about, that is a speciation. Now, that doesn't mean that just that we're discovering a new species because there are species out there now that are undiscovered. So how does that happen? Well, one of the big ways, and there are other ways, but one of the ways that we, we think hap this happens a lot is by something called geographic isolation. Um, sort of a classic example of this is Darwin's finches. These are actually Darwin's drawings um, of his finches. Um, and so Darwin noticed that on different islands, there were different types of finches. And what they further noticed is that they, they weren't all able to actually reproduce with each other. So what's assumed is that, so he found these on the Galapagos Islands, is that these finches were on different islands. And so they developed over the course of time into different populations. Think back to that bottleneck effect um, or the founder effect that's somewhere over here and somewhere over here. And that on this island, maybe there was a different type of seed that they needed to get to. And so their bill needed to be in a different way. So the individuals that had that, um, we're much more likely to survive and then reproduce. And so you got more of those on this island. Over here on this island, different kind of seeds maybe, and so they need a different kind of beak or maybe a different kind of feathers and camouflage and that kind of thing. And so they developed in a different way. And over the course of a lot of time, what this is going to lead to in most cases is to reproductive isolation. And that's one of the ways that we usually say that there's a speciation, that there's a break in species, is that they can't re reproduce with each other. Now, that's, that's sort of a fuzzy guideline, and really this is a fuzzy guideline in biology, because there are cases where there are some species that are able to interreproduce, but in general, that's the rule. Okay, so that's the first part of biodiversity that matters, that's the speciation. Um, the second one that matters a lot to us, and we can, obviously this makes good sense why we talk about this in environmental science classes, is the idea of extinction. Um, extinction is when a species ceases to exist. Um, and a good classic example of that um, is the passenger pigeon in the United States. We could talk about tons of others. Um, but at one point, these birds were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. There were millions and millions of them. Um, but they were sort of a favorite of hunters. And what happened is the hunters basically hunted them to death. Um, and then, so that there weren't enough of them to have a viable population, eventually they all died off. Now, there are a couple of different kinds of extinction here. Um, there's global, which means they all die off all over the world. And then there's local extinction, um, where they're going to die off in a certain area, but maybe they exist in other parts of the world. Um, and, and obviously, both of these things can be tragic. Global, obviously, more tragic than a local, um, because if there's a local extinction, it, there's always the possibility that maybe those species can be reintroduced, uh, something like um, the red wolves that we've introduced back here recently. Okay, so... Extinction is sort of the second part of that. Now, we can divide this extinction up in another ways. Some extinction just happens, okay? Some species just die off. They're just not fit, okay? And so as a species, they die off. Um, not doesn't happen a ton. Usually, uh, we, what we consider to be background extinction is that there's about one to five per year. And if you think that we've got, say, you know, eight million species out there and one to five species a year die off just naturally, um, that's what we call background extinction. Um, what is somewhat uh, scarier and what we worry about a little bit more are things called mass extinctions. And this is where there are large groups of species wiped at a time, sometimes up to about 95%. Um, and over the past 500 million years or so, there have been uh, proposed that there have been five major extinctions. And if you look here at the yellow triangles here, these are the big mass extinction events. And of course, why does this matter? Well, what, what matters is that we're kind of worried now that we might be headed towards a sixth mass extinction um, because of climate change.
But we'll talk a lot more about that as we go throughout the year. Hopefully that uh, it summarizes a lot of ideas about this stuff.